So, uh, Vinod sir and Suleiman sir, my question to both of you: You know, y'all have dealt with many cases. Any uh, case y'all want to share, or any mistakes that the junior advocates make? Y'all have dealt with any case due to the fault of the advocate, interpretation of the advocate, or inexperience of the advocate. The client had to suffer, and it was a big mess in litigation. Sometimes it happens when we, you know, don't read the documents properly. I'll tell you in one case, it was a leave license agreement. In the agreement, it was clearly mentioned that notice period will be 30 days. And the licensee was not paying the rent right from the day one. So instead of you know going through the details of the leave license agreement, wrongly that notice was issued that you should vacate within 15 days. So because of this, four months of the precious time was lost because the client had suggested no 15 din ka hi notice do so when it was argued in front of the competent authority the authority says why you have not gone as per the terms of the agreement in agreement it was clearly written that 30 days period has to be provided when you are giving a eviction notice so these are the things you know once the client says and our juniors also you know in haste they type it and they don't go into the details now what happens the client has to suffer for four more months to get an eviction order. They have to withdraw or file the complaint again. So if any case comes, try and read out the documents. Try to read out what are the conditions and understand the implication. If you bypass something here and there, and then in future it creates a complications. So reading the brief and making a note, and when you are... Uh, Sending a notice, you see that whatever was mentioned in the agreement is reflected in your notice. You cannot deviate from what is there in the agreement. So basically, one of the things what I had seen in one matter, the brief had come to me after earlier advocate was removed. And when we scrutinize the consumer court complaint, one such a blunder was made by the earlier advocate. We all know that black money is illegal. We all know that we are not supposed to keep any kind of black money. If it, if we have money, whether cash or white or whatever, we have to account for it. Very, uh, you know, in a uh, dangerous manner, when I was reading the consumer complaint, which was already filed by the earlier advocate, very nicely one statement was made that uh, the complainant has paid so uh, some 1 lakh or 10 lakh as black money to the builder. I read this and I told the client, did you consult this advocate or like, did you have to talk to him about this? In essence, the client, the complainant has admitted to doing illegal transaction, uh, admitted to doing black money. So then client says that no, builder forced us to pay the black money. So I said, you have to make the pleadings accordingly. You have to, it should be mentioned in like this, that I was made to pay black money or I was made to pay something in cash when I, even though I wanted to pay in check. So going through the complaints and the documentation, like Suleiman sir said, it is very important to very minutely go through whether it is a case that is filed and you're reading up on the case or whether it is an agreementation or it is a correspondence, a whole series of letters, legal notices that is written. Very important to go through and on the same line, implications of different laws is uh, very much prevalent in especially this real estate field. Normally, we think of something, we say this one law will apply and that is it, barely anything will else is, will apply. But in real estate, you have a whole concentric circle full of cylinder of laws. At the same time, probably 5 to 10 or maybe even 10 to 20 laws will apply. Contract Act, Transfer of Property Act, Stamp Act, Registration Act, Corporation, Development Control Regulations, your RERA, Consumer Court. So especially in this real estate field, it is very much important to have knowledge of implications of all those laws which are applying simultaneously. So just to continue in this one example, here, even though he had a property dispute, here, even though in the real estate uh, sector, even though builders demand black money, you are supposed to know that black money is illegal under Income Tax Act or maybe other things also like Money Laundering Act. And you have to be very thoughtful. You have to do a very careful analysis and study before you mention such kinds of things. Another uh, tip what I can say, like adding further on to Suleiman sir's uh, suggestion, what he said, go through the agreement carefully. One very old judge is there, we may all know him, called Lord Denning. Lord Denning has used a very beautiful phrase. He says that words are a lawyer's tools of trade. Think about that sentence for a minute. Take other professions or other uh, jobs, for example. A carpenter's tools, tools of trade are his hammer, nails, and all those saw and all those literal other tools. 
we may even go as far to say that a surgeon has a surgery tools that are his tools of trade you may even in a light way and say that a calculator is a chartered accountant's tools of trade but all these are physical tangible material objects as far as a lawyer is concerned the subject matter that you deal in the whole content of your trade and profession are the words of a statute that have been passed by the parliament lord denning goes on further to say that using the words and your arguments you will convince the judge using the words you have to make a contract or a deed or a will and whether you are making a will today using the words you have to carefully analyze that 100 years later also if the, this document has to be relied upon it should not be punctured it should be full proof so you have to envisage all the contingencies that may come to pass and you have to use your words today to account for the future so that is just adding on to what suleiman sir said that when you are doing drafting or you are uh, taking a brief or reading anyone's agreement or drafting anyone's agreement keep in mind that the implications of words used today or yesterday will the implications will run into the future also one other thing what i have noticed advocates uh, what specially new advocates uh, what they i have a small gap they instead of saying how the right is violated they just repeat the law for example many times i have seen advocates in court saying my lord the section says this the section says this that is required in some cases but they fail to say that my client's right under this section is violated for example they say that my lord article 21 includes the right to life and right to life includes so and so uh, having a clean environment or whatever for example so they just end up repeating the law and the judgment saying article 21 says this but they have to bridge the gap saying my client's article 21 is violated for so and so so don't just repeat the law connect the law to the facts of your client's case and yeah lastly that's it and just repeating on the thing of application of multiple laws you will be surprised how many plethora of laws will apply you will be thinking i have a property dispute say with a builder or same family dispute or whatever suddenly your wife will file some domestic violence complaint and under a dv act there is concept of shared household for example so you have to think implications of all these parallel laws applying that if i have dispute of one kind and another law is invoked what will be the correlation and interplay between those laws so unfortunately real estate is a sort of complicated field where hundreds of laws will apply at the same time and you have to be very thoughtful in analyzing how the provisions will apply you will even have to go through things like general clauses act rules of interpretation which we may pass off as unnecessary or irrelevant but they are not unnecessary or irrelevant when you invoke rules of interpretation when you invoke general clauses act to clear ambiguities that will go a long way in bolstering the interpretation in your case so i i will conclude with that sentence i would like to add a few things since this is a, a workshop for the fresh advocates or new advocates i will only request the younger yeah generation that okay be as simple no one is going to expect a uh, high expectations from you because everyone learns with the passage of time your duty as young advocate is to present the factual uh, factual things secondly it is very important for you to do proper research i have seen many advocates specifically if you have friends who are working as government leaders you will be surprised how casually they take up the matters they don't even bother to read the petitions i would say to that extent that i have seen it for so many on so many occasions i have seen it. you only should do proper research don't get emotional with your case set a decent time limit to do justice to clients and justice to your own self don't get too much and involved in a particular matter a matter is coming to you do whatever research is required have the budget of time for you otherwise at the end of the day you will go on spending time and many times you plan to speak so much but if you look at the high courts hardly you get 2 minutes or 3 minutes to present your say most important things in court is the body language if the judge is in your favor you should not speak more he is understanding you and don't try to contradict him also when he are, when he is in your favor so from the practical point of view the body language of the judges has to be taken into consideration and keeping that as the base you have to proceed your other for the case otherwise sometimes 
you may be right we have got everything and the judge is siding with you but you try to present the things more he may get more irritated and he may not give you the proper things simultaneously it is important to know which type of judge is there from which background he is coming and what is his approach so in that way sometimes even if you feel you are prepared you may have to take court dates so all these things will come and you learn with experience you may try to speak something but at times your hard work research may not cut the cake because a particular person who is listening to you is not very much aware of those things so all these things with the experience you will come to learn learn about these things with the at the initial level don't go for complicated jargons just present your factual thing these are the facts and now i leave it up to you if you have got some case law supporting it well and good even if you are not don't have the case laws explain the things in a very simple language these are the facts these are the things that this is the reason why legal injury is caused to me and this is what the prayer i am seeking be simple don't go for complicated jargon or uh, roman roman uh, this uh, particular uh, maxims there is no need for all those things adding on yeah. to that thing uh, if you think that if the subject matter is complex if facts are complex if law is complex then a judge must be liking complicated logics no absolutely not the true skill of a lawyer will lie that how to make a complex thing sound very simple how to break even the most complex and voluminous petitions into if you can summarize the biggest of things in just a few sentences and better if just a few words there is nothing like it that is the best thing if you think judges like complicated jargons you are absolutely wrong judges are also human beings they also want to come to the conclusion of the subject matter the simplest and fastest way they can come there is the best for everyone use simple words and in fact uh, in college one professor had given one dialogue which was the biggest education for me in uh, all these things he said use minimum words at that point in law college i was doing moot courts i was realizing one of the mistakes i was making was continuously after i had hit the punch line i was still beating around the bush and when i heard that dialogue from the uh, professor that use minimum words come to the point and come to the point simply and directly that was the biggest enlightenment at that time for me so keep it simple and see the judge's temperament many times you are a lawyer you may have max 10 20 briefs in a day you see a judges cause list daily board a judge has approx 100 matters per day so if the judge knows what he is doing if you think that oh i have to explain it to the judge the judge is a judge for a reason he has experience and many times he has seen many types of cases what you are bringing to the court so like vinod sir said when judge is taking your side it is often because judge has experience judge has perspective and knowledge of some kind of loopholes or some stereotype kind of cases so when judge is not to say that judge is taking your side but when judge is questioning or grilling the other side it means that judge is trying to understand your matter in your way only and another professor used to have a dialogue keep the quiet it is grammatically grammatically wrong he, to, he said it in a lighter uh, note in a slight humorous way he said that when the judge is talking for you keep quiet let the judge finish his line of questioning because judge is trying to understand the case when he is asking the samne wala it means because judge is trying to get some more clarity on your case judge has perhaps understood your side of the thing and now he wants the clarification from or counter from the other side do not interrupt that thinking process of the judge that's it to add up one thing i would like to question uh, all the advocates present there why do we write in paragraphs sir i would like to guess it <laughs> yes please vidil to keep it crisp simple and concise so that by keeping it in paragraph uh, form it is concise it is easy to grasp grasp the facts point wise to point wise event to event exactly yeah i am coming to that only see one paragraph should have only one point or one idea or one thought don't try to mix you know too many things in one paragraph because then it becomes very unclear now normally what happens when the client comes to you you are in the position he is showing you all the documents he will show you the photographs but you are able to understand it but when you are drafting it when the judge is reading it he is trying to visualize what you are put in the words right so if you are not choosy or selective about which words to use 
So the judge who is visualizing your story may visualize something else. Like in one of the case, you know, I was helping one of the advocate. There was a, a terrace above the floor, but he had written in such a way that the terrace is adjacent to the flat. So judge was not able to make out whether terrace is adjoining to the flat or whether the terrace is above the flat. So once you try to visualize this, and then some changes were made, and next time. she got a you know thumping order from the corporate court because she was able to make the judge understand that what she meant because terrace is a common area it cannot be sold by the builder to any private individual so these are the things you have to keep it in mind that whatever i am saying the judge is going to read and visualize my story he will try to understand my story if my contents are not clear then judge understanding will be not clear and you will lose a good winning case see i have come across recently come across a really bad experience there was a lawyer with nearly 25 30 years of experience we were arguing a final hearing in the supreme court now the clients were present he the person did get carried away and he was not in a position he was not allowing the judge to raise a query and very casually and in a, uh, the judge even laughed at him and said ke you are just you just keep on arguing you are not listening to me i want to ask you something but you are in the mood to only give answers later on in that same matter in that subject matter he made a statement just out of way he just got carried away and he made a statement this was with regard to a medical matter with difference was between the ayurveda and the, uh, the the judgment just came recently before three days it's reported in the times of india also that there was difference between the service conditions of the uh, mbbs doctors and the uh, alop uh, ayurvedic doctors so in this he just made a bold statement that in in gujarat there was uh, the ayurvedic doctors were also doing duty during the covid hours they were doing everything which a regular doctor does and there were no deaths in the in the city of amdavad this was the statement made by him which really irritated the judge and he went to that extent that this just can't be possible if you really want us to give you the data we are able to give you all india data right now so this is very important in case the client is present you have to stick to your own facts and if you don't know anything don't try to be over smart and say something out of the context because it eventually it did affect our case and we did lose so it's very important to just stick to your facts stick to the law be be very polite be very courteous in fact recently very recently in a in a lecture by uh, by uh, mr fali nariman he had inaugurated some uh, kerala university and he went to that extent he was reading out for nearly 10 15 minutes he gave multiple inputs one of the inputs was that when a judge casually makes a remark and he cracks a joke you just have to laugh a little bit and then you have to start on your own and then come again on the facts if you start to make create jokes or crack jokes or anything the judge may think you are joker these are the words which he literally used so it's really essential to can be concise stick to our facts yes and secondly don't try to act smart by knowing the law they they know the law much better than us they have been much more experienced for many years knowing the law we can point out the judgments only at the end of our submissions we need not point out straight away any judgment or anything because let him understand the case let him know the facts let him know your side he may grill you he may question you one should not think that he is against you his view is against you these these judges have the habit they would ask you 10 10 of questions and questions and in high court and supreme court the cases the final hearing cases they go even national consumer the cases go on for hours and hours and days and days so that's what's important for the youngsters is not to prejudge or anything just stick to your facts and everything if you don't know the best thing is uh, you should uh, request the judge that i will take the instruction from my client and i'll get back to you so in that case you will have more time you know to think about it and you should always have uh, you know senior uh, advocates in your network so whenever you need some clarification you can easily approach them you can take the clarification they will you know many uh, senior advocates are good at something you know they they have specialized in one field so you should have you should develop that rapport that whenever you want you can approach them and you know get a clarification what is the latest update 
you know, in many case, uh, I'll tell you, in uh, seven, eight years back, there was a good lawyer, and he was, you know, a good friend of mine. And I suggested my friend who was going through three fifty four uh, FIR, but then at that time there was a recent amendment made where uh, it was not bailable offence, but that advocate had not referred the new book, the CRPC. He referred the old CRPC. He went there with a the client. And uh, the client got arrested there itself because the say has to be obtained from the IO, that is investigating officer. So one silly mistake, he was not updated. He, if he had gone, done a research on the net also, that this is not a billable offense. So he would have gone to the session court to get an ABA. But instead, he straight away went for the bail. And then he was there for 24 hours. The next day he was released. So you have to be update. So whoever is good in that field, you know, in particular that area, always be in touch with them, and so that you can get the what is the latest updates in that matter, and your client doesn't fall into that uh, because of your mistake. He doesn't have to go into the jail. Like, see, in in case if we have time, also we we can surely manage. Like, if the matter is before a particular judge, if it's high court session, court, supreme court, any any whichever court it is. So it is always better just to go there one or two days before and just to try to ascertain the court, see his temperament, see in which type of cases, what is he doing, how is he reacting. So that's all, that also gives you an input because you have to present your case to the judge and he is the ultimate person who is going to decide your, your client's fate. Like uh, sir said that uh, don't go over and above the brief or don't try to be over smart. The dialogue that what I had received in college from the same lecture I was, exercise restraint. So a restrained way may behave. Karo. If you feel you are getting too excited, calm yourself down. So exercise restraint. That is the one thing. Like Suleiman sir said, that uh, bad drafting is often very bad. So in olden days, in fresh independence era, when technology was not that much, when everything was still typewriter uh, related things, the high court judges and the district court judges, they would literally read your petitions in the morning before the session would start. So to an extent, they would get an idea of the brief. As in when computer came, brief started getting more uh, bulky, hundreds of pages, thousands of pages. So instead of reading in advance, judges will hear you preliminary or they will hear you first and then they will end up reading your brief. But there's also a third scenario that in the middle of when you are arguing, judges will read simultaneously to try and get a hint of what you are saying, that what you are saying, whether it actually matches uh, what you have uh, drafted and also when judge wants to pass judgment or wants to make a decision later, will it be enough by reading your plaint or by reading your written submission? So the point I'm trying to make is judges will read your submissions often real time. You are arguing that point, judges will ask where you have mentioned it. They will open that paragraph, that page. They will hear you and they will read simultaneously. So it is all the more important for you to mention crisp, precise and concise pleading. Do not make the things more complicated. And lastly, like uh, uh, Sir said, observing court proceedings is the best. Like Priyank Sir said uh, that uh, go and see in the courtroom. Earlier also we discussed that you see the nature of the judge. So basically that is see the temperament of the judge. See that whether the judges will fit your style of arguing or whether you will change your style of arguing to suit that particular judge and that you will get by observing the open court of that particular judge. And in fact, today, many high courts are displaying full of their court days on YouTube. You go to YouTube, you type the various high court names. I think Gujarat high court is there. There are many, I think six to eight to 10 high courts are doing live streaming of their uh, courtrooms. So that observing court proceedings is the best education which you can get as a fresh lawyer to see how to argue, how senior counsels argue, how judges different uh, differ from each other in their temperaments, how one thing may be argued in one way before one just, but entirely different strategy or style of arguments has to be adopted for another. Yes, that is all I want to I have a query regarding the release date uh, in a particular scenario. If uh, there are two brothers, who are doing the release deed on uh, agricultural land in favor of another brother and a mother. And uh, uh, in, in that, in they mentioned that this is the release deed, they are releasing their rights permanently. And even after the demise of mother, whatever, uh, uh, after as a succession law, also whatever rights they are getting, they are releasing right now in the favor of another brother. So is this, is this a valid point to mention? Uh, uh, and so that they are, uh, Names are removed permanently from the Sadbara for that purpose. 
they can mention this point that even in future after the i mean they are releasing this uh, rights permanently even after the demise of mother also what is release date a right which flows to you on the demise of a person you are voluntarily releasing if you are having certain right in the property and you are giving away that right that requires stamp duty to be paid and registration to be done yeah get the market value of the property yeah but if person uh, father or mother is expiring and you being a legal and entitled for certain rights a percentage of the right you are releasing it of your own free will that hardly attacks 200 rupees stamp duty as i mentioned earlier section 17 of the indian registration act requires registration of certain documents stamp duty as i mentioned has to be done if you want to execute a release deed on the demise of your parents then certainly you can do it you are if you are getting a share you want to do it you can do it and that way it can be done but government dues have to be paid for that no one can stop you from releasing your right because you are not uh, you are sacrificing something that's your right you can do it but government share has to be paid there adding adding on to that what is a deed a deed a deed is a contract what is the underlying principle of any contract when it goes to the court the court will determine what was the intention of the parties that when contract is made they will look at the contract they will look at the words but they will not be hyper technical that if this word is used there will be this implication they will say that okay so and so are the words used but these words are used under so and so context what is the context what is the intention of the parties what is the actual understanding or deal between the parties so the biggest enemy in a in any kind of contract or deal is ambiguity and inconsistency between the clauses if there is any ambiguity in drafting or if there is any inconsistency in drafting that is one of the biggest dangers in uh, drafting so you just have to be clear in whatever you are drafting you can certainly put that clause that uh, i am releasing my rights and after uh, uh, i pass away whatever rights uh, my children will get that also i am releasing so whatever your intention has to be there just convey it clearly so that there okay. is no ambiguity and there is no inconsistency that's it uh, yes sir and another point uh, uh, then after let's say in future uh, after uh, 10 years let's say mother uh, expires and uh, the, right now the in the satbara the uh, names are of only mother and brother mm. uh, then the uh, can talati remove the name of the mother without giving the worthy notice to another two brothers who have done the release deed or he will have to uh, give the worthy notice to another uh, other two brothers show the proof show the flow of title that earlier it was in so and so people's name under so and so instrument they are not entitled anymore and these new people are entitled you show the flow of title if it gets complicated the court will ask you to get a court order in which case you will have to file a suit for declaration that so and so was the flow of title and as of today it is on this uh, person's name this person has the, so this person or people have the right title interest so if it is straight forward enough talat he will go ahead with it but if he finds that there is any ambiguity or complexity he will ask you to get a court order just and submit uh, all the relevant documents at the talat he first see what he says yeah yeah and uh, now uh, is the whatsapp uh, uh, notice given accepted as a evidence sir it it depends see for example in high court just one two days ago i noticed what the judge said they said no even though you sent by whatsapp you sent again by hard copy service the post what was that under the context of that was under the context of service of the entire writ petition so where the subject matter is the service of the whole writ petition they have insisted that you do a proper service the service by registered post as is recognized by the law so that was for the whole writ petition so it this uh, kind of interpretation is very subjective and it depends some judges may allow some judges may not allow more of what i'm saying is that most judges are more inclined that whatsapp they are avoiding especially for full fledged matters if it is say submitting of one letter or just some simple document of two three page four five page document which is say even if it is the main thing if it's small in nature practically what i have seen they are allowing it i have served him by whatsapp but where it is a voluminous paperwork they i have seen that they insist that you do proper service what bithil is saying is perfect in during the lockdown they were allowing the whatsapp service also but then people started misusing it because through the whatsapp screenshot 
I can, you know, manipulate, I can fabricate, I can have that blue tick mark and throw it to the court that see the service has been served. But in fact, it may not have been served because uh, recently I went for a workshop where, you know, how your message is from your phone, I can send it by the same number what you're holding there. If I have your number, I can do some manipulation in the server and send the email also and the message is also of that number which I'm not having it. So nowadays, uh, these things are not allowed. Recently, though there was a De Delhi lower court judgment, recently like the Supreme Court trend in the re registrar's court is when service is not complete and the matters go before the registrar for completion of service and all. Even the registrar of Supreme Court recently had uh, given a judge, uh, judgment or given a press thing that we will not accept service by way of WhatsApp or email. Now, I yes. had a similar matter. It was a transfer petition. The it, it is evident that the husband will not win in a transfer petition. He will not even appear. So, in a transfer petition, I had to get some clerk from uh, Ahmedabad to go to Bombay. He had to uh, physically ring the bell of the person. He had to serve him and then he had to get a receiving from him. And then we had to file his affidavit. It, that only was treated as complete service. Whereas there is a slight contradiction also. If the matter comes from registrar before the court, Many times the court usually allows it. It's the judge's discretion. They say, okay, they have tried two, three times. It's okay. It seems service is complete. They would pass an order. So this is so what it, is the problem. It, it problem. will depend on matter to matter and judge to judge. Yes, there is no con absolute consistency. Yeah. But th this WhatsApp and all, at the uh, registrars do create a problem. I mean, I, I think they are answerable to the honorable judges. So they, they are afraid or I don't know what is their problem. They do create problems. It is a grey area because it, this thing yeah. came out during COVID when COVID restrictions were there, post was not able to be gone, but still courts were functioning for very urgent matters. What is very urgent matter? Building wala hai, demolition is happening, someone is going to pass away, death is involved, that is very urgent. Uh, someone is in jail and his incar incarceration is in question, that is very urgent. So in those type of scenarios, so, uh, Supreme Court allowed WhatsApp service. And as of today, there are different courts, there are different precedents uh, operating, but I would advise that err on the side of caution. Don't rely on WhatsApp, do your proper service also. Yeah. If it is something of urgency, you send on WhatsApp and two days later send by post. So you, you will have a better stand in front of the judge that my Lord, I, I, whenever it was fastest possible for me, I have scanned him and I have sent him. And after that, immediately when I got the chance, I sent a proper hard copy notice. So kindly take into consideration that he received the WhatsApp and from WhatsApp, you may consider if he's not filing reply. So, err on the side of caution. Sir, what is the difference between a joint owner and a co-owner? I asked a senior and the senior said there is no difference. But there are many judgments that draw a distinction. So, in practice, is there a difference between a joint owner and a co-owner? There may be one small difference. Co-owners implies equality of ownership, 50-50. Joint ownership, especially in property, can be that I have a flat, uh, I have taken the flat 70% on my name, 30% on my wife's name. So in that, we are both joint owners. That may be the only practical difference, that co-ownership may be 50-50 and joint ownership may be different ratios. Other than that, I don't think there is any difference. Okay. Now there's one query in the chat box for Vinod, sir. Uh, sir, what are the prospects for lawyers in the area of cooperative society? Can you elaborate the career prospects? Basically, it depends on the individual. Cooperative society is in fact a good scope for interaction. Whether your friends are there or anywhere in the pro circle, all of them are mostly residing in cooperative society. So it is easy to get work. Secondly, if you excel in any sphere of life, there is always, always there are the good scores. Cooperative society definitely is full of equals. If I put it humorously, among the 26 alphabets A to Z, there is one alphabet I. And the distance from the alphabet I to the word E, the B, is full of uh, ego issues, clashes. And that is one of the reasons why you will always find battles in the cooperative society. Ego issue clashes are there. Then there are small, small things. You are going to office and someone has parked your car in front of your car or something of that sort. So now obviously your temper will run high. And every day something or the other is likely to happen in cooperative society. So society is a good field of practice. The growth rate in that may not be that good, but consistency is certainly there in this sphere of practice. 
there is another joking dialogue i give you put 10 people in a room four out of 10 are bound to disagree with each other that is human nature you can't help that where there is disagreement there is dispute and in society the bigger the society the bigger the scope for dispute keep that in mind all uh, the young advocates you start with small act like rera senior citizen act which has only 29 to 32 sections so master them and slowly slowly go into the bigger uh, x so initially you have to master with the small small x and then go forward so senior citizen act uh, nobody has yet you know um, done anything much about it so that is one field where you can you know um, help the senior citizen and uh, i'll tell you one thing even the competent authority we have actually in competent authority we are not allowed advocates are not allowed but you can draft a simple complaint with the to the senior citizen he can go there and then if the order is not in his favor he can go to the appellate then after appellate it comes to the high court and by default this senior citizen act hearing is taking very fast and the judgments are given very fast because justice gs patel has said that uh, the senior citizen don't have the luxury of the time you know they cannot waste 10 years 20 years now when at the age of 65 or 75 when he is going to the court you cannot expect him to wait for the justice for another 10 years so the, at that time the life is like an ice cream if you don't enjoy it and if it melts everything is gone so by default every judge you know they give try to give the earlier date and try to resolve the issue or give the justice or the judgment very fast and very quickly so what of the expect is that you start your practicing with senior citizen act then rera act and then cooperative act and if you have any difficulties we are all there to help you out like vinod sampat he is like my elder brother and a fatherly figure even whenever i feel there is a doubt i call him in the middle of the night he picks up the phone don't worry and he gives the solution and mithil is like my brother so we all you know like uh, uh, priyanka diaru to try to make a network try to make a family you know so that whenever you need some help or some expertise and it is easily available to you i have a small query regarding the bill uh, if in a will let's say there are certain five to six properties mentioned and during the lifetime let's say out of that one or two properties are uh, alienated or given as a gift deed to then uh, still that will be be valid no or how uh, you mean to say will is of suppose today's date and on tomorrow's date someone else has transferred right like that yeah the the uh, will maker the one who is making the will uh, uh on certain so if it is bona fide agar kuch fraud nahi hua matlab suppose say will is first yeah. january uh he has alienated the property say some months later first may and suppose he is passed away even uh, some more few months say first august is that yeah. the scenario that uh, there was will yeah. property changed and then he passed away right yeah yeah correct uh-huh. that much will be excluded from the will it will uh-huh. be implied you will just have to make a submission because when you file a will you will also have to submit the schedule of property so in that accordingly you will have to make a pleading and mention in the table that although this was mentioned in the will this was alienated or transferred Okay. alienated may be the wrong word because alienated uh-huh. may imply that i have just left possession but title is still mine so let us not use the Achoo. word alienated let us say he has yeah. removed uh, the property like he has okay. sold the property suppose so mention the yeah. pleading accordingly that even though uh-huh. this property is mentioned in the will after the date of the will so and so is the proof of transfer say sale deed or whatever transfer deed and uh, make the submissions accordingly and uh, mention it in the table acha yes it will be implied to be uh, out of the scope acha ha you just have to give an evidence that this property was disposed when he was uh, in his lifetime lifetime ha ha so will will not become void just because of that acha ha yeah that's what i wanted to know anyone wants to argue in the high court or in the city civil court in the magistrate court without looking at the brief uh yes sir so we want to argue before a high court yes. so there is one technique that is called a linking technique so why in a, in the beginning i asked you why we write in paragraphs right so the paragraph will contain only one point and the one point will be contained you know one keyword next to that paragraph you write the keyword the moment you know that the keyword you will know the complete story of that paragraph then immediately go to the second paragraph ask the question 
how, why, when, where. So, one husband and five wife theory is there. So, one is how, that is husband, and then five wives. You just ask why, where, when, what, which, and you will get the answer. So, the moment you come to know that this paragraph has this central idea and this is the keyword, the moment you get the keyword, you will get the whole paragraph. And then link each paragraph's keyword, make a small story. So whenever you are there in front of the judge, you know that this keyword means this paragraph or when he is asking, you are ready with the answer and you know it is on which page. And it, with the uh, time passing, you will then memorize that it relates to which exhibit also and it, the exhibit is on what page. So without looking at the brief also, you because when you are doing this, you are trying to understand the body language of the judge, whether what you have said the judge has understood or not. If not, then try to, you know, change your language, change uh, this thing, the way of your presentation so that the judge can understand. Um, our uh, senior friend, Dr. Uh, Advocate Mahesh Vaswani is not there. He made me, you know, understand that when you are in front of the judge, you see that you are explaining a child that this is the concept and make them understand that what you want to convey. Or the best way, the other way is if, the, because you are young, I cannot give the ex, uh, example of that a husband makes understand his wife. So when he's able to convince his wife, that means he has that ability when he's standing in front of the court, he has to convince the judge also that this is what my point and this is what the relief I am seeking. So if you go with this preparation, you will come with the flying colors. I think uh, Sir is just trying to say that in other words, give titles to your paragraph and pleading that so-and-so point has so-and-so uh, topic of discussion. Am I right, sir? Yeah, yes, perfectly right. My advice to youngsters, don't try to learn all the laws. Yeah. Work a small, small period of six months, one year, it's fine, you just grab the law, general laws. But these are the days of specialization. Don't try to be expert in all the laws. If I ask, uh, ask my junior friends, if you analyze your whole day, you will find that most of your time you are running from port A to port B and port C. So bulk of your energy is going traveling and traveling and you are not familiar in a better manner with the court people, the judges, etc. Just pick up a few uh, acts of your liking or where you feel you get more potential clients. And just concentrate on two or three courts. Don't try to move out and do too many courts. The practice, area of practice is entirely different at the trial stage, at the high court and at the lower courts. I can say with an element of confidence that many senior counsels are totally ignorant of the grassroots working of the court smaller courts. So don't try to learn everything. Be satisfied. Your stomach is there. You may have 10,000 uh, best of the food items and uh, uh, delicious items. But can you give justice to all those 10,000 items? As long as you are able to fill your stomach with four, five, six items, you don't have to take for a take at uh, try and taste your food. Just be satisfied with a few laws. See your strong, strong points, see your weak points. One thing is always common in all young, old, rich, poor, and that is time. How you utilize your time will ensure that you are excelling in life. So, my common mistake I've seen everywhere is youngsters want to jump in different uh, spheres of uh, want to learn however different spheres of law, which is not practically possible. You should know the art of curtailing your uh, your time for a particular segment of things. That's all. Okay. See, one of the important tips is, see, once you take up a case, once the client comes to you, remember always remember that the client is in is in a serious trouble is in serious trouble he has come to you he with full trust and confidence with consideration whatever consideration you have taken it's, it's part of your duty you have to take it and thereafter always be loyal to him there have been many instances we we receive especially the delhi and north india there have been complaints i have handled a couple of cases which have come to me and the clients have told me that advocates had taken money earlier and they have not appeared 
they don't receive our call so please don't do this because eventually remember one thing in my case i would give an instance that after being a lawyer and going out in the public and society people see you in a different way if you are a high court lawyer a trial court lawyer supreme court lawyer whatever it is so always live up to that expectation never degrade your profession and remember one thing that the client has come to you with everything he has lost everything and he is relying on you so you have you should step into his shoes there after your solemn duty to do it the order is to be given by the judge you have to do your best go out of your way do 150% and then it's it's destiny and fate if i can just add why usually use the dialogue that lawyers are on the same uh, situation as doctors if when you have a health issue or health emergency you go to a doctor with a full you you are trusting your life to a doctor just like that i would say client is trusting their life and their money savings property whatever is the dispute whatever the sub, they are trusting you with the same or more and uh, i think uh, uh, if i can summarize what vinod sir just said perfectionism will be your enemy if you try to say that oh, i will learn all the laws i will have 100% knowledge it is impossible there is a dialogue that not even judges know the full law because law is such a vast subject and if you try to go in perfectionism you will never achieve any of the work so just do the best you can go deep in one field specialize in one full field and start from there don't try to get everything in one go don't try to be perfect i will get perfectionism then i will start my work no that is your enemy in fact in fact in, on the, on the supreme court website there's a group called friday group where distinguished seniors retired judges and all come and give an hours lecture uh, mr shekhar nafde eminent senior advocate from mumbai the, the, uh, you people would be knowing him first hand like he gave an uh, lecture on constitution and uh, doctrine of separation of powers he openly told he confessed in front of everyone that keshav nand bharti judgment he has still not been able to understand what it's trying to say apart from the two lines which we all remember about the basic structure should not be altered people don't have any clue like there were 13 judges but it has been thousands of pages and it's the most difficult thing to interpret it, 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 the locus tenda is in two two lines it's just two lines but it is next to impossible to interpret for someone so it's just like you know have to know your limitations whatever it is you have to leave it at that and i think just to give context about what this judgment is keshav nanda bharti is not just one of the biggest judgment is it is one of the most important judgments of independent india i think one or two days back it that judgment completed some 30 or 40 i think 1977 judgment yes and years. that was uh, i think the judgment that came after the dark era of uh, emergency so, so not only was the period very crucial for the judgment but the subject matter also what it spoke about it saved constitution and it saved uh, the democracy of india from becoming into a tyrant hands in the executive office so that is just the background of what was the subject matter of keshav nanda bharti it touches upon the rights of uh, executive uh, compared to the judiciary and parliament and that judgment just to give context it is insanely big it is how like i said it is thousands and thousands of pages and you there should i am sure there will be dedicated courses just to understand that particular judgment law colleges will have special lectures to understand that judgment or some uh, legal coaching will be there just for that particular judgment that is what keshav nanda bharti is let me end this session with a humorous fact one case has been going on for more than 90 years now it is resolved at that time india included areas of pakistan bangladesh sikkim bukam bhutan etc so many generation or two or three generations have passed so many judges have transferred because by the time the judge he sees the brief and tries to understand that judge gets transferred the property was not only in india but in uh, pakistan and many other countries so how would you implement that particular thing in our profession the sad part is we are devoting our time not on the fine prints of law or the argument but only in waiting so you should learn how to come out of frustration you may prepare yourself and go with fully prepared invariably courts will grant you dates invariably restrictions of yours restrictions of opposite party restrictions of judge so as an advocate you have to be and you should have patience you should not be emotional with clients or with lawyers i have seen lawyers fighting as if it is a personal enemy why should you be a personal enemy any of your lawyer friend or brother sister you have to respect equal him equally you have to ensure that you are doing your part properly 
whether the judgment comes in your favor, it goes against you, or the other party is able to do better than you. It's okay. It's a part of it. Sometimes we are on top. Sometimes they are on top. Judge. And lastly, I always tell my uh, colleagues, judge can only make one party happy. But if both the advocates are mature enough, they can sit across and resolve the issue, they can make both the parties happy. So you should sometimes apni jeet mein bhi hai, aur apni haar mein bhi jeet hai. So you have to take a practical approach many times. Our, our courts are full of egos. Many cases are fought not because of uh, the uh, substance in the case. It's like a, a, a one proverb I read in Reader's Digest. Many people call a doctor just because they want a companion to listen to them. Same way here, because of ego, so many fights are occurring. And if you look at the substance over a span of 5 years, 10 years, or 20 years, you laugh. But was it worth fighting, taking such things? So you have to be mature enough, you have to be practical enough, and you should not get personal. Let the Lord take its own course. You should not spoil relations with advocates. You should not have ego issues. Be frank, simple. Try to understand your client's problem. Try to understand your uh, opponent's problem. And to be a successful advocate, you should first know before when you are taking a brief of a client, always think of the questions with the opponent's advocate is going to ask you and how you will reply. If you are able to master this simple technique, if you are ready with those type of answers, you will do justice to your clients, is my humble submission and my advice to juniors. I think if I can just add on to that, your fellow relationship with your fellow lawyers can also be looked at in this way. Many, when Kasab terrorism case happened and when matter went to court, many people started asking that why is even a lawyer defending Kasab? The counter to that, what that lawyer said that even doctors have treated Kasab to make his health better. He was hospitalized. Did you blame any of the doctors? No. Then why are you blaming the lawyers? At the end of the day, we are just doing our job. That is our profession to represent the parties, to put the facts across to the, the judge, the, to put the facts across with the law that is applicable. In fact, uh, just answering to this, ke, there was a, there, there are questions also in the AOR exam and anything. Ke, a simple question, would you ever defend a terrorist? Now, there was recently a judgment, it was, uh, I think, 8-10 years ago, so Mohammed Rafi versus State of Tamil Nadu, where the Tamil mm -hmm. Nadu bar had passed a resolution not to defend a person who had done a terrorist activity. The matter came up to Supreme Court and it was Justice Kadju, who in his own language, he used the Bhagavad Gita and said ke, when a lawyer accepts a brief, it is a part of karma and duty and he quoted the Bhagavad Gita also. So that is always a part of your profession. So it has to be done. Irrespective, it is not you who, will, who are going to decide whether he is guilty or not. It is the system and the judges who will decide it. You are only doing your solemn duty to the best of your ability. 